And so uh, that can, that's very broad use, marijuana, opiates. Um, I forget if tobacco was in there, other hallucinogens. Um, so, so yeah, r I would say roughly, uh, according to that data, roughly half of society's shamans are, are using psychoactive substances. One thing I push against in the book, though, is that I think there's a lot of enthusiasm, especially now, to talk about the frequency with which psychedelics in particular mm -hmm. are used across societies. You'll find claims like psychedelics were used are used around the world and, and have been used for millennia. But if we're talking about classic psychedelics, serotonergic psychedelics, there's very, very little evidence. Um, the best evidence would suggest it was um, a proportion a portion of societies from the Rio Grande and southwards. You have no other place in the world where you have reliable evidence of classic psychedelics used in shamanic contexts. See, so, so if we're specific with the terminology here, a serotonergic psychedelic would be something like DMT, and so ayahuasca would would be an example of such an agent. Yeah, ayahuasca, peyote, yeah, these but, snuffs. Yeah, but, but some of these other psychedelic or psychedelic-like substances that might be used around the world. Um, maybe iboga would be an example we could talk about. They're not serotonergic. You know, we, we, can, we can go deep into the science. I don't think that's our, our purpose here, but people have used psychoactive substances of various yes. kinds um, quite a lot. It's not always the case. That What I'm sort of taking away from you is that the shaman is always going to enter into non-ordinary states for his or her purposes, and they'll probably use whatever tools and techniques are at their disposal in that particular part of the world.